Great. Well, uh, nice to meet you, Mark, um, in virtual person. Um, we've been wanting to do this podcast for a long time and talk about our mutual interests in the evolution of consciousness, but also you sent me a copy of your book, uh, which is well underlined and noted, notated at this point. Um, so I know you've read my book, so we really just wanted to have like a- For the paper, I have a copy of your book right here. <laughs> Fantastic. <Jesus Marcus. laughs> Oh, it's good. It's good. We're doing the video recording then. This yeah, time. yeah. Um, so yeah, where, where to begin? So first of all, welcome to Mutations. Welcome to the show. Um, and for an, our audience today, and I think this is something that you and I are both are working on, right? It's um, people don't necessarily know who Owen Barfield is, or if they do, they know, oh, isn't he one of the Inklings? And the same thing with Gepser, like, oh, isn't he connected with Ken Wilbur and something about consciousness? So Maybe to start off with our audience, um, for the for newcomers to Owen Barfield, who was this guy, right? And um, we know he was an inkling, but what was his sort of biographical connection to this very well well known kind of literary circle in the mid twentieth century? Yeah, um, well, it began in the nineteen twenties um, when Barfield went up to Oxford, and there he met C. S. Lewis. Um, as undergraduates. Um, so this is after the First World War. And um, they met through a mutual friend and fairly quickly started what they called an oppositional friendship. Um, Lewis had this quite a nice idea that you meet a first friend who's someone that you just click with and you feel you have everything in common. But then you meet a second friend um, who you know you're going to wrestle with for the rest of your life, um, but you can't quite let each other go. And at the time, Lewis was still an atheist, whereas um, Barfield had already, in a way, made his great discovery, um, which was through poetry originally, where he felt that, um, as he put it, the inside of the whole world could open up to him once more. So whereas Lewis, you might say, was still very much wedded to, to use a Gebser kind of phrase, a sort of mental consciousness structure, um, which is manifested in analytical philosophy, particularly wanting to prove things, internal coherence, all those kind of qualities mattered. Barfield had already started to trust um, what he called the imagination, which was this sense that a vitality could speak to him from the outside in, as well as his own inner vitality. Um, he, in particular, discovered it through poetry and then through words, realizing that words have a kind of soulfulness themselves. They kind of release and energy when we use them. Um, you know, we don't just, as it were, point, um, but we communicate a whole feeling, a whole world, a whole sense of meaning. Um, and, and so this oppositional friendship um, was very influential on Lewis, um, and eventually he becomes a Christian and gets much more into the imaginative. Um, they meet Tolkien as well. Tolkien was a little older, um, and um, Tolkien was already, you know, immensely knowledgeable about ancient mythologies and languages and was already lecturing in these things. Um, but I think that meeting Barfield and reading Barfield for Tolkien made him realize that um, this could become a sort of way of life as well as just an object of study. And so Tolkien too starts to write and writes his very, very successful uh, mythopoetic uh, works like The Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. um, so through their kind of exchanges, um, I mean, I th I, I'm not just championing my man Barfield as a word, but I think Barfield, um, both Lewis and Tolkien said that Barfield's ideas had a much bigger impact upon them than their ideas had on Barfield. But of course, both Lewis and Tolkien in their own way are kind of genius writers, um, mm -hmm. whereas Barfield um, is a more uh, knotty kind of writer. I mean, he's one of these writers, maybe a bit like Gebser, you can get a hell of a lot out of him, but it takes quite a lot of effort and struggle. Um, you know, hence wanting to write my book to... Mm -hmm introduce Barfield in a more accessible way. And I, I too found that in your book as well with Gebster. Mm. Yeah, this is a good uh, moment also to ask about what motivated you to write this particular book through the lens of the evolution of, of Christianity, really, right? Because the subtitle is Jesus, the Last Inkling and the Evolution of Consciousness. And through the book, you're, you're taking us through um, in a very Gebserian, Barfieldian sense, right? The usage of language, right? Um, what a word means to somebody from 3,000 years ago versus, you know, somebody even in the time of Jesus versus somebody in the time today. And the word transforms and it has a completely different kind of meaning. Um, so I really appreciate how you do that. But 
what were some of the motivations for framing the book around the evolution of Christianity to guide us through the evolution of consciousness? It was um, both um, personal uh, and a sort of tactical decision, if you like. Um, the personal side is that, you know, I was born in a Christian family. At one point I was a Christian priest. I fell out with it. I've had various struggles around Christianity. Um, so discovering Barfield helped settle quite a lot of that for me because Barfield has an account of the figure of Jesus, particularly, um, that makes sense in terms of this evolution of consciousness. Um, so I could, there's a lot more one could say about that, but it kind of helped me to um, feel that, you know, Jesus isn't someone who saves us, which is the kind of fairly standard Christian idea, um, as if something's done to us, um, nor is Jesus just a sort of moral exemplar um, that we've got to somehow imitate, um, but that Jesus um, brought something, as it were, in the, into the world by constellating it and crystallizing it, um, which means that it's then available to us all. Um, this kind of way of life wisdom, um, it's only... Um, fully known when it's actually been lived, when it's been shared. Um, and uh, so that helped me understand uh, Jesus as a kind of pivotal figure um, personally. But then more sort of uh, strategically, I wanted to try and write about Barfield in a way where I could use a material that people would have a felt sense of and not just describe his kind of ideas in abstract, because I think that's one of the great problems. They can often remain in abstract and then they don't really live for people. Um, and since, you know, Christianity, if you like, is a language I speak, I kind of understand it, uh, at least, you know, in larger degree. Um, I thought I'd go through the history of Christianity, which I start about a thousand years before Jesus, actually, as the beginning of a new consciousness unfolding, take it through the time of Jesus, medieval period, and then into the modern period where something different starts to happen again. So hence Christianity being in lots of trouble now. Um, yeah, so it's, it's both sort of a personal issue, but also so that I hope it kind of speaks to at least some people um, who um, either have a direct or, you know, in the West, a sort of broad sense of Christianity, which we all have, I think, by virtue of living in the West. No, I found it to be a very good anchoring point to, to take us through this history of the West. Um, there's, it, it's a loaded uh, uh, topic right now, especially, I don't know if you saw the Rebel Wisdom interview with Ken Wilber, where he talks a little bit about the evolution of Christianity, or not Christianity, well, he does use the Moses example, um, but the evolution of religion through the evolution of consciousness, and I know integral theory talks about this a lot, um, but what I appreciate about Barfield, and by extension what you're doing in your book, and comparatively with Gepser, is there's some kind of way that both Gepser and Barfield seem to get under your skin and almost in a certain sense, allow your subjectivity to open up to another form of subjectivity in a way that, that once that you grok their language, once it clicks and you know what they're doing in their texts, you can have a kind of a revolutionary experience for you as a reader, right? To kind of not just think, okay, people had different beliefs or a different set of worldviews, but that the way in which they perceived and inhabited and experienced the world and let's say the numinous was completely radically different. And to have just a taste of that as a modern person is such a transformative act. And I think this is what Gepser does very well. And I think this is what you're doing in this book very well as well. Um, so maybe you could give us a couple of examples. I know I mentioned, um, uh, you know, using a word differently, but uh, you mentioned Numa in the book. Um, I think you mentioned the word theory itself. You've also mentioned this in other uh, podcast interviews. So maybe you can take us through a couple of these, these transformative examples on, on how particular words or phrases and meanings can really kind of open up a different subjectivity. Yeah, well, so, well you, you mentioned the word pneuma um, or ruach in Hebrew. Um, this is the word which nowadays we have to translate either as spirit or as breath, perhaps, or as wind. Um, uh, the, the wind and spirit opposites um, with the breath sort of somewhere in an intermediate state, both in us and, and external to us. Um, and the point there is that we have to make a decision whether we're going to call it wind or call it spirit. So uh, a very well-known biblical passage from John's Gospel talks about the wind blows where it wills, so it is with the spirit. And in the English translation, wind becomes a kind of metaphor for spirit. But in the Greek, it's pneuma both times. The pneuma blows where it wills. That's the life of the pneuma. Um, and so the idea is that when that was written, people had a very different experience um, of themselves, as you say, 
um, not just their worldview, um, which is a very mental structure kind of notion because the idea of worldview is you're kind of like you're part from looking in. Um, whereas there, this is much more immersive kind of experience that meaning as it were life, the divine flowed within as well as without um, that kind of experience of life. Um, uh, similarly, you know, theory in Plato um, wasn't a kind of theory, a proposition that you tested, that, as it were, existed objectively to you that you could kind of prod and poke and put to the test. Um, it was a journey, really, that you underwent that changed your perspective. It was much more like a pilgrimage. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, so once you start to sort of get a few of these examples, as you're saying, um, they start to make you question in a way your own stance. Um, and and then that's that sort of struggle, that discomfort sometimes is though the beginning of a new possibility. And I very much like both Barfield and Gebser because, you know, in their work, they do take you through lots of examples. Um, I mean, it, I love Geb Gebser's idea of the perspectival, um, you know, which you've spoken about a lot, of course. But this idea that a bit like looking onto the world and um, looking at the vanishing point um, as if we're sort of looking at the world a bit like looking at a, um, a high Renaissance picture with its 3D perspective. Um, and I think Barfield's analogy, sort of parallel analogy there was, he caught, talked about camera um, vision, uh, where he imagines that we're a bit like cameras that um, are, are sort of black boxes inside ourselves, but we go around taking sort of snapshots of the world that we kind of grab um, and then try and file and hold on to in some sort of way, categorize. Um, I think he, I mean, you know, I don't, he wasn't alive when the selfie had been bought and he died just a few years before, but I'm sure that he would have seen that maybe the selfie either as um, uh, this sort of perspectival world gone mad, or maybe as it's kind of exhausting itself. Uh, perhaps that's the more positive way of putting it, that it, we're starting to realize that we have to do more than just constant kind of grab bits of reality and somehow position ourselves in it. Um, but the first step is to realize what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's often not welcome. I mean, you know, the, the, another key pattern for Barfield is that the, this cycle takes um, kind of struggle and discomfort uh, and sometimes very, you know, tragedy even. Um, but there's always something new that can be born from within the crisis, which yeah. I get is a, is a Gebzerian idea as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that there's, there's so many. And just to kind of highlight the, the significance, I think, of this is, as you're saying, as you start to collect these examples and then start to reflect these examples back on yourself and your own embodied forms of perception and meeting making and sense making uh, you start to I wouldn't say you, you know you, you lose yourself to some degree but um, you start to question yourself in a healthy way and, and locate who you are and what you're doing as a kind of an activity in the present as a modern it's like oh yeah, yeah, the the I love the camera metaphor. That's fantastic. That's a I think Gebser would have loved that if he if he had read it. Um, and I'm not sure how much he had read of Barfield because I know they they overlapped in their in their lifetimes, but I don't know how much literature he was reading from the English world or not. But um, yeah, I mean, just as, as an aside, I I did have a dig around. Um, yeah. And I mean, I, I looked in the ever present origin, and Barfield's not in the index. Um, yep. but, uh, but also on the Barfield Literary Estate website, which has got a lot of Barfieldian material now, Gebser isn't on there either. So it's, they, they, they must have had points in common, like Goethe. I think, you know, they both knew a lot about Goethe and they both read about, you know, very well-known literary figures and so on. So they shared a lot of material, but uh, whether or not they were aware of each other, you know, more than just having heard of, I don't know. I don't know either. I, I know that, um, at least sort of biographically, it sounds like, with Barfield um, connecting with the imagination and with Gebser as well. I mean, he wasn't, you know, as, as dense and as um, difficult to really grok as he is at the outset, he was a very poetic thinker. You know, he was introduced to these concepts and to these experiences, uh, what he called the integral consciousness through poetry, through Rilke, through Goethe, through, um, you know, kind of in a wanderlust, just like traveling through Europe and, and you know, um, following in the footsteps of Rilke and writing poetry with the Bohemians in Spain, you know, in the 20s and 30s. So, so he also seemed to have this poetic affinity that opened up these other dimensions of subjectivity. Um, and I think for, for Gebser as well, this just had, was a pivotal um, uh, factor in, in being able to write about the evolution of consciousness as being able to get in into this somehow, like get involved in it somehow. Yeah. So maybe we move into um, 
probably the most well-known, at least, you know, at the outset of Barfield's concepts. And he talks about final participation and original participation. And you talk about how there, there's a kind of a, uh, a cycle with this, almost kind of like an in and an out breath. That's sort of what I was imagining as you were writing about it. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe you could tell, tell the audience a little bit about what Barfield meant by these terms. Yeah, well, the, the in and the out breath is, is very nice because I think that what Barfield perceives over millennia, so over kind of periods of cultural time, so say moving from ancient Hebrew culture, ancient Greek culture of Homer and so on, through to the modern age, um, is a shift, broadly speaking, just to put it very sort of broadly, from a, a sense that life moves from the outside in, um, that, as it were, the gods, nature, um, others, um, your community, um, that's it, as it were, the primary location of your own life. And so um, in ancient cultures, um, a lot of the activities of the everyday um, are around navigating that kind of sea of meaning, um, whether it be through religious ritual and whether it be through uh, uh, reverence for ancestors, um, you know, the, the, the practices of the tribe, that kind of communal living. Um, very sophisticated. I mean, I think this is another thing I like both about Gebser and Barfield is they don't see these things as primitive in some way. They see them having their, their genuine real wisdom, which they've got something for us. We can pick that up later. But nonetheless, that's the kind of earlier um, sense. Um, then there's a kind of process of alienation where um, one steps back from that um, and it has this downside that it's a struggle crisis and that can happen on the cultural level as well as, as an individual level but what that does is it um, intensifies the sense of interiority your own i-ness your own sense of self um, and in a way you might say the individual is born um, I think Barfield thought this was the great sort of gift of Christianity that whereas the sense of individuality was beginning to emerge elsewhere it definitely was it's was part of a, a, an unfolding it kind of crystallized um, in Christianity um, and then that was then picked up um, in other traditions as well. Um, other traditions having their own genius. Um, but with that sense of interiority, um, as it was put in the medieval world, the inner microcosm could start to reflect the outer macrocosm again. Um, and then in the modern times where there's been another sort of struggle, another intensification of individuality, this is where the, the man, in, imagination particularly comes in for Barfield and the move to final participation, as he calls it, um, which is where your interiority actively, consciously uh, knits with external life, external vitality through, at first, your own imaginative undertakings, um, be they artistic um, or otherwise, um, just as a way your experience, your, the, the, the vitality of your own experience. Um, and then through that, you start to realize that the external world is speaking back to you, is connecting with you, but with this crucial um, difference that you haven't lost your own sense of self. Your own sense of self is now fully conscious, uh, as you put it, fully wearing um, the outside world. Um, and uh, yeah, another phrase of Gebser that I really like is um, a sort of sober intoxication, um, <laughs> which he uses. So as it were, sometimes now we try and get that sense of oneness just through intoxication. Um, uh, but I think that both Gebser and Barfield are saying, no, 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 it's got to be, there's a kind of sober intoxication uh, where your rational faculties are fully operative, actually. Uh, the, these, this capacity to discern um, is fully operative. And the point about that is it then gives you a freedom to navigate through the inner life of all things. Um, and that sense of uh, a kind of conscious freedom is really important uh, for Barfield in final participation. Um, and that's one of the things that differentiates it uh, from original participation for all that he values original participation too. Yeah, there's there's a lot of connections here with um, Gebser's expression of of what he says. You know, we for for him the 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 original participation is something like you know origin or the archaic, right? And it's sort of this innate wholeness of the human being and all of these different dimensionalities and potentials of of um, creating experiences, right? Different experiences of time and space and spirit and self. And uh, very similarly to, to Barfield, it seems, the whole point of, of integrality is bringing together the whole rich 
multi-dimensionality of human experience and sort of wearing through it. And I love the phrase that Gebser has, it seems very resonant here where he describes it as clarity instead of mere wakefulness, right? Yeah, we have right. been through the evolution of consciousness that, that you're, you're articulating here as well. Like we have consolidated wakefulness and selfhood. And now part of that process at, at, at this juncture is to bring forward the whole rich history, all the different tapestries of, of human experience into the present or to find them in the present, right? And to somehow, you know, it's not going to be something higher. It's not going to be necessarily something, um, you know, more Baroque, but it's, it's, it's almost simple, right? It's, it's bringing oneself back to the present. It's bringing oneself into this state of clarity and openness and spaciousness. And um, I, I love that about what Gebser says about it. But, you know, as I was reading through the book, as well, your book as well, there are so many interesting uh, overlaps and connections. Like you're mentioning, uh, I think Jan Asman's talking about the, the development of a canon in the evolution of consciousness or, or in the evolution of uh, Abrahamic faiths, right? To have a text. And then you also bring up to connect with that, the example of Moses not having a place, right? Like he had the laws, but, and yes, there's the, there's the um, talking with God in, in the bush on the mountain, but then, you know, he himself is sort of transient between places. So it becomes less important about the sense of space geographically or even animistically, but more about the sort of transcendent law, right? And similarly, Gebser talks about this too, that with the, with the rise of self-consciousness and mental consciousness, we get jurisprudence and we get rights and we get laws and we get edicts and this kind of thing that we see in a lot of early civilizations. So the movement of this sort of from place into the, into the law, right? From the living um, embodied animistic space of presences to the centration and then also the abstraction or transcendence um, out of place is such an interesting shift. And you talk about that in the book. And I, I think that's, it's really helpful for us to kind of get that, that like there's a kind of a archeology span in our own religions. These are not just static texts with flat beliefs that may have particular claims. They have this rich history of unfolding in them. Um, and you really bring that out in your book. I'm really glad about that. I mean, the, 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 um, the idea of the king is re- you can sort of track the idea of kingship as an indicator of these, um, these, this evolution or these mutations, to use the Gebser's words. Um, so, you know, like the pharaoh, you know, you mentioned Yan Asman, the great scholar of ancient Egypt, and the pharaoh um, is where the whole society as it were, sees itself in relation to the one king external. Um, and that's the same, I think, in the kings in the earliest bits of the Hebrew Bible. And then Moses is so interesting, as you're saying, because Moses doesn't have a kingdom and he dies before he enters the promised land. He's, uh, it says in the Bible, no one knows his burial place, so he's not venerated as a king. He's definitely seen as a prophet, a prophetic sort of transitional figure, if you like. Um, nowadays, um, we tend to regard ourselves as sovereign. Um, you know, we, so we're taking kingship into ourselves. And that's got the upsides, as you mentioned, there of rights. Um, everyone equal before the law, universal education, these kind of things. Um, but I think that what we also need to start to see ourselves, to use Shakespeare's phrase actually, which comes to mind, is that we're also, um, we can belong to a kingdom of infinite space, um, as Hamlet says, that, um, that this freedom that our own autonomy gives us is not to be locked in our own worlds, but actually is to be able to step back into the world um, and, and to navigate it. Um, which you know, mystics talk about, the ancient philosophers talked about, um, but now I think it's becoming a th- something which everyone can aspire to because we sort of value the individual as a universal uh, feature of life. Um, but it mustn't stop there. Um, we must keep going with uh, stepping back into the inside of the world, um, which uh, you know, was, was known before. So you, you mentioned um, actually towards the in- end of the book, one of your chapters is, is we must be mystics. So I, w- I wonder if you want to go into that a little bit in, in terms of what you just stated, and maybe if you can connect that a little bit to this final participation, because, you know, um, I think, yes, it's infinitely helpful and transformative to study the history of consciousness, but it always brings us back to where we are right now with this this pivotal moment of the present and this mutation in the present. So um, maybe you can riff on that a little bit, and, and what what are we what are we trying to do here? You know, what, what, how do we open back up? And, and did Barfield uh, offer us any paths? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, the word mystic can be a bit mystifying, but it means something quite simple for me, which is 
um, it's, uh, it's, it's to sort of return to an informed experience. Um, so it's to try, we must be mystics is, we mustn't just take things as it were on proof even, let alone on authority, um, but because we know them in ourselves. And the point about knowing something um, in your own experience um, is that you share with what you know. And um, I think it's because it's become part of you that you know it. You know, a, a loving relationship is like this. You know your partner better than, say, your friend knows your partner because you share in their life um, that little bit more through the, um, the intimacy of being, of being partners. Um, and so in a way, your partner, the mystery of your partner opens up to you a bit more um, than just the, the regular friend and might know that person. So it's this kind of sense of um, both experiencing, but experiencing because you become joined with in some way. Um, but again, not joined so as to the two become one, but so that the two become more than just the two in their integralness, in their integration. Mm. Um, I think that's one way of thinking about it. Um, and another way, um, which again, just reading a bit of Gebser before we spoke now that I thought a lot about is in relation to time um, and how I think that um, it's some, the, the mystic doesn't just experience clock time. Um, they don't just experience, um, you know, today, tonight, worrying about the future, um, feeling stressed about the past, um, kind of caught in a linear time. Um, but there's something about all times that become present uh, for the mystic. Um, you know, mystic like William Blake will talk about eternity in the palm of their hand, and the palm of the hand being a particular place, and yet somehow in that particularity they can see um, it all, the, the, um, see eternity. Um, and and I mean, that, that really came alive for me, actually, uh, through psychotherapy. I work now as a psychotherapist. Um, and I think one of the things that happens in psychotherapy is that the notion of time opens up for you. Um, but people often come in psychotherapy very trapped in the now, um, in a sort of point nowness um, that is holding them and is, is leaving them feeling unfree. Um, and what you gradually try and do in various ways is open that up, perhaps by reflecting on the past and how the past is informing the present, um, perhaps by uh, helping people realize that there's more depth in their interior life, um, perhaps just by the experience of coming to therapy, actually. Um, you know, the, the thing about therapy is it's quite boundaried, um, but yet within those boundaries, that helps you see how things can be experienced really very, very differently. Um, you know, so sometimes the therapy session really drags, sometimes it just goes by without you even realizing. Um, and I think that's a different experience of time that's dropping us into a kind of interior eternity. Uh, um, and so you gradually, I think through therapy, get, are able to operate across these different levels of time to be both in the present in the sense of focused on the particular doing something now, but being present in the sense of how the past and the future informs the present too. Um, that much more expansive notion. Um, and I, so I think that all these ideas are part of what it is to be a mystic. Um, and that uh, this is, I think we must be mystics um, because then that is to step into this integral or final sense of participation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've found uh, yet another resonance here too, because, you know, with Gebser's writing, when he's ending up writing about what integral consciousness is, he, towards the end of Ever Present Origin, I'm not sure if you have gotten to that part yet, but the very final chapters, he talks about Christianity. He talks about a, a kind of a reopening of the heart and a rereading of Christianity in light of this, these kind of integral characteristics. And he basically says, you know, it's all there. It's all kind of latent in, in this faith here in the West, uh, if we read into it in, in that way. And for, for Gebser, a lot of the writings specifically about integral consciousness tends to sound very spiritual, right? He, it, it sounds very, not only, you know, this kind of integral form of Christianity that he refers to, but uh, there's almost a, a kind of a spiritual Taoism in the writing, like where he talks about the ego kind of releasing itself and kind of non-action action and, um, um, instead of a, a flurry of activity, one is to be poised, right? Um, and he has many other examples like that, but he goes to the poetic and the spiritual to talk about this. And I think maybe to some degree, this is why, you know, the canon of Western philosophy doesn't really like to touch Gebser too much, not only because he, he's this kind of big picture thinker with a sweeping, you know, history of consciousness, but also when it comes down to it, um, he's, he's pointing us towards these spiritual qualities that 
he's saying this is what it actually means to to attain or, or concretize the integral it's to become more spiritual as a human being um and i know with barfield as well um there's an interesting connection with him and rudolf steiner in anthroposophy so um it, it there's a connection there, but there's also a bit of a detour because I know Steiner and anthroposophy is a whole other ball game that we could, we could uh, dive into. Um, but I was wondering if you'd want to just maybe kind of touch on that briefly, uh, make that connection a little bit for those who are curious about that. Um, I find it wonderful that, that somehow anthroposophy ha is within the sphere of the inklings, you know, and it had some kind of influence there. Yeah. Um, although again, the sort of anecdote is that, uh, Lewis only mentions, C.S. Lewis only mentions Steiner once um, in an essay called The Abolition of Man. And he says, I even hear that Dr. Steiner might have something to say. Um, <laughs> and it, it was a constant uh, point of bone of contention between the two of them that, that Lewis could dismiss lots of people, but he always read them first. And Barfield said he dismissed Steiner without even reading him. But anyway, that's part of their kind of biography. But the, the, uh, again, the, the, the Christian side is really interesting to me because... Um, uh, Again, because Gebser does talk about, he talks about an intensification of Christianity as the kind of way forward. And, and that is a very resting phrase. And uh, I wonder what he meant. And I'd, I'd be interested in what you think about this to yourself, actually. But I think with Barfield and also with Steiner, um, the reason why Christianity is of interest to them is because in the figure of Jesus Christ, they see an individual fully born um, so they see uh, in the Christian doctrine the idea that someone's fully human and that full humanity is what enables them to fully reflect the divine so that they become both fully an individual and fully transparent to the divine, to the cosmos, to nature, to everything. Uh, and so that is kind of really clinched um, in Christianity, certainly Christian mysticism, Christian spirituality anyway. Um, and I think that they felt, therefore, that um, the move forward, the move towards final participation, um, is in a way a new thing for us now, because our um, goal is to remain both fully individual and um, fully poised um, to share with the life of, um, well, the Logos in Christianity and the Tao um, in Taoism, um, but that sort of pulse, that current divine pulse that runs through all things. Um, and that, I think, is different. This is why I wonder whether, whether you feel this too, but what's different about, say, um, older mystical traditions, where the status of the, of the self um, is much, is not fully worked out, I think. I'd even go so far as to say that. Um, and so when you, you see it now, when people say return to Buddhist texts um, and feel very unsure about what no self means, um, is it a sort of denial or even a denigration of the self or a dissolving of the self? Um, uh, whereas I think, uh, read through the Barfieldian lens, um, what this is saying is it's actually a kind of a riching of the self so that the self gets over itself um, and can be, to use a more Christian phrase, kind of in the service um, of um, that which is around, um, fully, uh, uh, fully clear, fully awake, um, but in the service of that which is around. Um, and so I think both for Barfield and Steiner, the Christian pivot is it's just a way of putting that in the Western world and that um, we need to move into a, a different um, integral consciousness is not the same as stepping back into an earlier kind of consciousness, which is maybe where a lot of earlier Christian, uh, earlier, sorry, earlier spiritual writings are written from. And just to read, um, say, the Vedas, um, or maybe even earlier Taoism, I think it begins to change in Schwanza, actually, in, in Taoist texts, is my, my sense. Um, but um, to read these, um, these earlier texts without taking that on board, can be very confusing um, and lead people uh, uh, in all sorts of sort of uh, um, regressive ways rather than uh, more integral ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gebser made a very similar um, uh, pointed remark or a series of pointed remarks about that, that a lot of the mystical traditions, because in, in the history of consciousness, the self hadn't fully discerned itself or been, you know, that, that separate self sense hadn't been fully achieved, it was much easier to kind of go, let's dissolve it, let's kind of undo it, and then return to this original state. And Gebser's always saying, um, whether or not he's correct about all the traditions doing that, because I do think there are some interesting examples in Taoism and Buddhism, etc, that maybe, especially in the non-dual 
kind of traditions um, that seem to at least implicitly get it and we can work with a little bit better as moderns. Um, but he also believed that we had to retain the self and the achievements of the history of consciousness, that like the mental structure and the ego that had crystallized was not something that needed to be undone. It just needed to be kind of opened back up and retained somehow, maybe more porous, maybe more permeable, maybe more transparent, but it's, it's the structure of consciousness shouldn't be something that completely deconstructs or dissolves. And the only way forward would be to find a kind of an intensification of consciousness that we find in mysticism that's, that you're mentioning in Christianity um, that allows that selfhood to be retained and transparent at the same time. And so that was really critical for him as well. And it sounds like this pivot into the integral is really this question of, okay, so how do we allow the self to become transparent without losing the self now? Because we've reached the kind of immoderate version of selfhood and egohood and, and spatialization. And, um, and so maybe this is a good moment to kind of pivot as well to um, Barfield and Gepser in the present, right? Because we're in this moment of, hyper alienation, hyper fragmentation of cultures, the culture war on the internet is just running rampant. Um, you know, Gebser has that, that phrase perspectival. Um, and we have this other phrase going, going around today called post truth. It's like, we're the foundations, right? And for Gebser, I, I find it very uncanny because it's, he was talking about how, you know, the perspectival eventually would kind of eat itself up. It would just sort of divide reality until the point where there is no shared solid perspectival ground anymore of objectivity. Everybody has their own kind of micro objectivity. No one's able to cross those boundaries anymore. And it, I'd like to hear your thoughts on where Barfield thought we were headed and then also ways to navigate the present, you know, Barfield's relevance in the present. I, 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 we both feel, I think he has tremendous relevance as long with, along with Gepser. So it'd be great to hear from you about this question. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I mean, maybe by way of doing that, just just to pick up on this kind of earlier point that um, when you mentioned non-dualism, um, it made me think that you know the Bhagavad Gita, um, which was you know written uh, in the uh, you know the the, the, the centuries before um, Christ in India, of course, but in those earlier centuries, at first it's read as a quite a conservative text where the individual, it's t the teaching is the individual must stay in their own caste. But then you get the um, the commentators in, I think, in the third and fourth centuries AD, who uh, see something that was sort of latent in it um, and start writing about non-dualism. Um, and so start seeing um, uh, Krishna consciousness emerges from it, um, which the individual now um, can um, sort of aspire to. Um, and um, it's a kind of like a vertical dimension to the individual as well as the horizontal business of caste. Um, and I think that, that the reason I say that and I, the reason I think non-dualism um, appears is so, so of interest to us now is because in a way we're, we're engaged in a parallel task now, I think, um, which is to see ourselves both kind of in the world but not of the world. Um, that's the, the kind of Christian phrase, to reawaken to um, the vertical dimension as well as the horizontal. And I think that when you stay in the horizontal um, you stay much more in this kind of post-truth, post-modern, dancing on the surface, um, you know, maybe perceiving endless sort of structures um, in reality, um, you know, getting very sophisticated about that, um, but at the same time, never quite escaping reality. And in fact, you know, some people saying there's, there's nothing, nothing outside the text, so there's not, there is no escape. Um, that's just uh, a delusion. Um, but I think that, um, that someone like Barfield is saying, um, no, um, there is always more. Um, uh, the, the, the surface um, is not, can't sustain itself, it can't create itself. Um, it, it needs an ever-present origin and that uh, the rediscovery of that um, is what we're about now. Um, beginning, uh, again, um, we, we must be Janus-faced, again that's a Gebzerian phrase, but the idea is we, we both live in this world and are wise about that, but trying to look in another direction too. Um, I mean, the, the key faculty which we have uh, to do this for Barfield is the imagination. Um, because the imagination is something which comes out of us um, and, as it were, uh, projects onto the world. Um, he was very aware that often our imagination makes mistakes. Um, and, you know, this is a key issue in psychotherapy, of course, too. Um, it can be just mere fantasies. 
Um, but what he he used Coleridge's di distinct distinction between fantasy and imagination. Um, Coleridge said that fantasy is just playful. It just kind of goes around. It plays with what's known already, um, mixes it up, maybe makes you laugh, maybe makes something look sort of beautiful, but um, nothing more than that. Whereas imagination proper um, takes you into new worlds entirely. Um, and so, you know, a Wordsworth poem, um, maybe a bit like a Rilke poem, um, doesn't just feel like it's entertaining you, it feels like it's taking you somewhere. Um, and that um, if you let yourself be led by that experience, that then can become something for you as well. Um, so um, it's those kind of capacities um, that we do have, a, a full human consciousness, again, not just the kind of AI consciousness, um, uh, where, which is uh, just transactional, I'm just trying to do something in, in clever and cleverer ways or faster and faster ways or, you know, progress per seen as just sort of more of the same, um, but just better, cheaper, more widespread, more global. These things aren't bad in themselves, um, but they don't achieve the kind of vertical takeoff um, that I think Barfield um, said we must be alert to as well. Um, and that vertical takeoff is when um, our consciousness expands itself. Um, I see great signs of this in, in e ecological consciousness. I think this is part of the reason uh, why the ecological consciousness very naturally integrates with integral consciousness. Um, it's a crisis, absolutely. Um, but that crisis is precipitating um, the need to feel differently about the world um, and to feel ecologically. Um, and so uh, the sense that um, the world in which we live is alive has its own consciousness, its own awareness. And um, I think that's really vital. Um, I think what Barfield also does, and this is one of the reasons why, like Geb said, just one more thought, um, is he's also quite clear that this is a spiritual undertaking, and um, that this is about um, the gods returning, you might say, um, whether it be a kind of spiritual ecology filling out again. And um, I think that's why he likes Steiner, because Steiner, as it were, a bit like William Blake, you know, lived with the angels. These were realities to these individuals. It's often not clear what to do and what to make of these new realities returning. And because um, we don't have the consciousness structures fully developed to know how to relate to them, but to be open to that, um, what sometimes called the paranormal um, or the divine, if you're more conventionally religious, um, and the hierarchies of being um, in a vertical sense, as well as in um, the, the sense of, of the na nature's ecology, um, to be opening onto that is absolutely crucial for Barfield as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, this makes me think of um, a quote that Gebser uses in Ever Present Origins, quoting Holderlern. He says, behold, it is the eve of time. I'm paraphrasing. One God after another is coming home. And I, it, there's this sense, and this is the next natural question I was going to ask you. Um, what are the, because a lot of the folks who listen to this are kind of overlapping with what we're calling the sense-making community. Um, and I, I like the word especially lately because it's, 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 it gets us into our subjectivity. It gets us into exploring how we're perceiving, experiencing being in the world. And so, as you're saying, we're in the midst of this ecological crisis. We're in this sort of crisis of, of consciousness. You know, how do we enact this integral world, uh, this final participation? Does Barfield offer us any, well, twofold question, does Barfield offer us any practices? Does he have any recommendations? Does, you know, does he write about like what to do and how to kind of open oneself up? Is, is it a matter of reading poetry and literature? Is it a matter of um, doing some kind of, um, I know he probably didn't recommend meditation as like a modern consciousness person would, but um, are there any kind of implicit practices in his writings? And then B, maybe following up from that, um, you mentioned this towards the beginning that we'd come back around to it, but if the gods are coming home, this is a very interesting turn, right? We're, we're opening back up to, to previously, you know, running dormant structures of consciousness that are coming back very powerfully and need to be integrated and understood and not just through the lens of, of being a modern, you know, camera perspective, right? Um, a spatial consciousness. So there's a kind of, we need a lot more room and spaciousness for these other forms of, of perception and being in the world. So, Twofold question then, you know, what are the practices to help this whole process? Yeah, well, maybe, maybe there's, um, 
there's kind of negative practices and positive practices. So I think the negative ones to do that first um, are to realize the str is to realize the struggle, is to realize the neurosis, um, is to in a way realize the reality of where we're at. Um, uh, and to use a Jungian expression, um, mentioning gods as well, you know, Jung famously remarked that gods have become diseases, mm -hmm. um, that we know these external uh, vitalities now, often as particularly psychological diseases. Um, and I think that Barfield did feel that um, the death of God, to use the Nietzschean phrase, had become a kind of um, a disease in the modern mind um, that needs its remedy. Um, but it's not a kind of remedy like just taking the pill and fixing it. Um, it, is a, it is a psychological disease, which means going into it and understanding it. Um, that's broadly speaking how psychological conditions are treated. Um, uh, you, you kind of go into it. The parallel there would be um, the older spiritual intuition that the way beyond suffering is through the suffering, um, not trying to get rid of the suffering. Um, so um, that's the sort of negative way. Um, and and Barfield knew this in his life. I mean, he, he did, uh, he had bouts of depression. Um, in a way, his life was not a great earthly success. Um, unlike Lewis and Tolkien, um, you know, he lived a lot of his life as a lawyer in a law firm in London. So um, this kind of struggle um, was not always wanted even for him, but I think it was, it was something that helped him focus and forced him as it were to work through things. He wrote books. Um, one of his books um, is called This Ever Diverse Pair where he imagines two partners in a law firm. And one of the partners is kind of Barfield's spiritual self. And one of the other partner is, is Barfield's material self. Um, uh, and he sort of sees the two t wrestling out together. Um, but maybe that segues into the more positive practices, um, which are certainly literary. I think, you know, poetry is absolutely central. Uh, uh, and then his own uh, efforts at writing as well to work things out. Um, and um, that, Joint engagement, of course, is then you, you're not just receiving um, someone else's creativity, but you're using it as the seed for your own creativity. So you get that movement from the outside in to, and then the inside out once more. So some sort of um, practice like that, whether it be writing, um, whether it be other kinds of art, um, you know, whether it be trying to build a life, you might say. Um, these are things which you don't just do to get by, you do to change. Um, but there is also the parallel with modern meditation because I think another influence that Steiner has on him um, is that Steiner developed what he called a spiritual science. And whilst um, it, it, it's not always easy to understand, I think um, there's a core notion, which is that by becoming familiar with your own inner life, um, you, are to, you actually start to see there's more going on than just your own inner life. Um, when you understand the way that you work, um, you start to see how there's more going on than just your own personal, you might say, stuff. Um, and I think that meditation is quite like that too, that there is, you might say, the clinical or the therapeutic benefit of meditation. Um, but it, I think, quite naturally leads into a spiritual realization, as long as that's not cut off by some prior metaphysical commitment, um, you know, some sort of scientific materialist commitment or um, that kind of thing, as long as you don't prevent that a priori. Um, you start to realize there's a kind of spaciousness in your own inner life um, that then can be seen as other consciousness, other beings uh, speaking to you. It starts, first of all, with your, your family, with your ancestors um, in a fairly standard psychotherapeutic way, um, but I think can uh, expand out from that as well. Um, so meditative practices of one sort or another. Um, so look, with the key aim of learning something about your own inner life so that you can start to become aware of more than just your own inner life. Um, that's the kind of key dynamic I th I, I, I've, I've understood it as anyway. Yeah, I, I very much resonate with that. And, um, you know, one of the overlaps, I think, between Gebser and Barfield here is it, what Gebser talks about, and, and this is all implicit, you know, he doesn't really ever come out and say, do, do this practice or this practice will help you. But uh, laced throughout all of his writing is um, um, a suggestion, a very gentle uh, and constant suggestion to cultivate some kind of, and he wouldn't call it meditation, but he's always asking for hyper wakefulness, that one moves through the study of consciousness and the history of it and really engage with it, but then also to have a kind of, and this is what you do in, in meditation practices very often. Um, my 
one of the teachers I follow quite a bit, uh, Shin Zen Young, he calls it equanimity, right? So it's not kind of reacting against or, or, or from, it's just sort of being poised and open and spacious and present with, right? So he's always asking you to be present as you are embarking on an admittedly very heady and difficult study on the history of consciousness and engaging, um, and this is the secondary aspect that connects with Barfield, um, engaging poetically and imaginatively with the history of consciousness, right? Because, you know, he's, on the one hand, he's saying we have to become aware of the history and aware that, you know, the magical structure and the mythical structure or just that, that people embody the world differently, you know, a thousand years ago, but that that aspect is still in us and a part of us and somehow becoming aware of that, that requires an imaginative process of envisioning it, um, reading about it, maybe looking at art or interacting with something creative and exploring oneself in relation to that. So it's a very kind of subjective um, um, exploratory and imaginative process that in the in the meanwhile you're supposed to be hyper present you know and have equanimity so there's a kind of a contemplative orientation that he's really asking you to do as you study the history of consciousness and not just make it a schematic and a model right he's really asking you to participate in it and really engage with it and the only way to do that it seems is, is a presence and then b imagination um you know really kind of uh, I, you know, I, I, as much as I have trouble with like, you know, going to museums and, and how they're presented in a very kind of modernist way, there is something profound about being next to an artifact that's from 2000 years ago or 3000 years ago and wanting to reach out and touch it. You know, there's a desire to engage with an object, even if imaginatively. And I think that can help us explore our own nature and our own selves. So um, yeah, I think both of these authors and these scholars of the history of consciousness are really asking us to get involved in what yeah, I love that idea of, go, of a museum as a kind of spiritual practice. I mean, I go to the British Museum here in London often and to go into say the Egyptian galleries is to stand before these temples, these, these sculptures that came from a very different consciousness and yet have a powerful presence now. And to, to as it were in your mind, flip between trying to imagine what the original consciousness was like and then to imagine why it's calling for something in your consciousness now um, as well um, as you stand before it in this more contemplative or aware kind of attitude um, rather than just sort of studying it or learning about it or that can help fill, the, fill these things out um, and I also like I think what you were saying there about um, metaphysics and metaphysics sort of reconceived as um, a way of helping reality in its abstract forms to speak to you rather than just metaphysics as in tying up the limits of what we can know, um, which is a kind of more uh, modern approach. Um, so for example, I mean, a, a very transformative experience for me um, was being part of a group that read Dante's Divine Comedy. And we really read it to try and get it to work on us, to speak to us, and partly to unsettle us, which of course is what happens when you go through hell. Um, and then you go through purgatory, which is this state where you know something might be shown to you. So hope returns, but it's still quite a struggle. And then into the paradise where um, uh, it's, it's quite a metaphysical part of the work, actually. Um, but it, what it's really trying to do is open up a different consciousness to you um, so that things like time, uh, you realize you start to get a sense they can be experienced differently as Dante experiences time differently as he rises through the different heavens. Um, so it's, it's metaphysics as a spiritual practice, too, that um, is not just self-sufficient reason, you might say, um, but this kind of discernment that is also a kind of opening. So it works on you. It, it forces you to um, to grow um, as much as to grapple. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, just to circle back around to um, one of the initial comments about having a lot to learn from the history of consciousness and, and, and having, you know, in Gepser's terminology, you know, the, the magical and the mythical structures have their own genius, right? Their own brilliance, but then also their own mastery that, that in the long history of consciousness have become subsumed and folded in and sometimes cut off from, you mentioned, you know, the gods become neuroses from Jung. And then um, Hillman talks a lot about that too. James Hillman, for those who are not familiar, um, where he says, you know, that the loss of, of, participating with gods and ritual and, and using utilizing the kind of the sacred imagination with the landscape um, has created a lot of these problems as well. I mean, these, these tense, these um, 
um, how to put it, that without that, those kind of containers of ritual and sacred practices, these energies kind of um, become almost demonic, you know, uh, um, they need these imaginative containers, they need our participation in order for them to be channeled in a healthy way. And so I think the question, and this, this kind of comes around to a lot of the work a lot of folks are doing with like um, reconnecting with indigenous communities and tribes and, and sort of, um, you know, the, the apologies for colonialism, but then at a deeper level, the kind of reconnection with the sacred with many of these cultures and communities. Um, how do we factor that? And this isn't necessarily a, a, a Barfield question, maybe just a you question. Um, <laughs> how do we factor that into um, this this current crisis, right? And, and sort of re, I don't know about rehabilitating, but reconnecting with that, you know? Um, does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this thought comes to mind, see if it makes any sense back. Um, I mean, you were, you took this, the, 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 the fear of colonizing um, and, and, the, and the colonial past. And, and that work, I think, does a lot of work for, that word does a lot of work for us because I think one of the things that happens with the mental consciousness structure, although it, it has its own emancipatory element, there's no doubt about it, but what it wants to do then is master, is to colonize. I mean, I think that's what a lot of people um, are fearing and sensing in the cultural wars of now. And that what we need, I think, is not um, just to critique that, although that's part of it, and but we need to realize there's another consciousness that can move us beyond that sort of relationship um, and I think it is a relationship which becomes one of mutual learning um, that um, the past uh, starts to be recognized um, for its own genius um, and that um, that informs our own struggle now. Um, so I, I see some sort of dynamic like that going on. Um, you know, so uh, there is, there's a kind of, you know, labeling phase, there's a kind of war of, uh, of words that goes on um, you know, don't colonize my space, this, this kind of idea, and there's experiments with new words, um, uh, particularly in terms of personal identity, of course, some work, some don't, you know, the rough and tumble of all that. Um, but ultimately, I think uh, um, the idea is to try and move on to something else um, that, that, that are particularly crucial, I think, um, in this move from mental structure is to move beyond the notion of progress, kind of linear progress, um, uh, as if because that always carries the assumption that uh, there's a sort of better state of being. Um, and I think it's not about becoming better, it is about integrating. And this word integral is so crucial. I mean, but Barfield's favorite uh, uh, shape for this was the U shape, rather than say the upward linear shape, or even just the kind of spiral shape, because spiral still has this notion of, uh, of getting better, as it were, getting higher. And um, whereas U, you like the U because when you, you descend through the alienation, but when you return up the other side, you actually return to the same level as before, but just from a different vantage um, and with its own kind of sense of things. Um, so that U shape has been quite helpful for me. Am I, am I, am I as, as it were, returning, trying to visit, say, the Egyptian gallery um, in the British Museum um, to return to um, the same level as the great pharaonic sculpture, um, um, but from my own vantage? Uh, rather than sort of dismissing it as some kind of pantheistic nonsense, um, you might say. Yeah, yeah, that, that's funny too, because um, Gebser's always mentioning, like, he's always chiding the reader to, like, not do that, you know? He's going to, all right, I'm going to go into ancient Egyptian mythology, but don't you start dismissing this, like, um, and, and he'll, he'll just remind the reader not to do that as we go along through the text. Um, so, yeah, I also, you know, there's an implicit you in Gebser's writing too, and I think we talked about this in our initial email exchange um, a little bit, uh, that the archaic, as Gebser says, is is all of the structures, it's, it's innate integrality. So really right there at the outset of this whole history of consciousness, he's, he's demarcating the first structure as the whole, it, it's all there, but it's all kind of latent. And then it kind of unpacks itself in this nonlinear unfolding way but when we get to the integral it is more like that you because it's like everything that's been there from the beginning has sort of fully integrated itself and realized itself and it's and it's sort of back to where we were so the archaic and the integral are kind of mirrors of each other um but now as you're saying there's a there, there's little differences right um the self is realized the we've gone through that alienation process we now have achieved this um, this ego separate self sense that's sort of mastered spatialization, but then also it's not 
only dominated by it. Like if we remain there, we'd be at the bottom of the U, you know? Um, so there's this kind of return process that's also here. And for me, like what Barfield's saying, what Gepser's are saying, just in terms of the, um, the narratives here, because I know Wilbur has been critical of this, um, but, but I think there's a, there's a deep nuance and profound nuance here about, about the history of consciousness. Not, it's, it's not a kind of pre-trans fallacy. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that with Wilbur. Yeah, yeah. He, he sees people who glorify the past as being wrong and it's only forward that we have to go. And I, I strongly disagree with that. I think this is not about going backward or forward. It's, it's that U shape. It's, it's something else, you know, and Gebser talks about that too. Like it's not about ping ponging, you know, there's, there's something else that's kind of presentiating through that is not about directionality anymore. Um, mm. It's a different orientation towards time and space that the integral is able to, to achieve here. And it, to me, it sounds like that's exactly what Barfield. Is. Yeah, I mean, Barfield's kind of technical way of putting it is the, the anterior, sorry, the interior is anterior. The interior is anterior. And he means that, as it were, um, inner life contains it all already. Um, so it comes before um, how it unfolds and how it manifests. Um, and I think you need a spiritual dimension to do this. You do need a sense that, um, you know, consciousness is active. Um, it's not just something that emerges out of an unconscious state or a non-conscious state. Again, which sometimes you can uh, read about people telling uh, a kind of big story of, of what it is to be human. And um, there's a sense that, there were, first of all, there was matter and then consciousness somehow emerged from it. And um, I think both Gebser and Barfield would say, no, 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 um, consciousness can only emerge out of consciousness but it can take on different forms. Uh, in particular, the particular can learn to relate to the one, um, or there's different kinds of freedom, you might say. Um, and and, and more, more experientially, I think that, again, I, I feel I've learned something about this, at least through therapy, because I think the point about therapy um, is not that you reach some superior level of consciousness and just sort of sit there. Um, the point is you can move across all different kinds of consciousness. There's a kind of ability to move and to flow. And sometimes, um, a kind of pre-consciousness is where you need to go. I mean, you might say you do that every night when you sleep, but the point is that when you are able to work with your dreams, you can do something with that, that pre kind of consciousness. Um, uh, and, and, you know, if, we're, if we, we suffer stress or something, we often need to, to regress to some degree, but um, you don't get stuck there. Um, the trauma occurs when you get stuck there. So I think that the sense of being able to move across different kinds of consciousness is really key. Um, in, I, I mean, I, I, I see that more myself, but I think that that comes out of Barfield. It's in Barfield too. Mm. Uh, are you familiar at all with the work of Marshall McLuhan? Uh, because I was well, gonna- Only a little bit, so do tell me. I mean, he's, he's a name obviously that, you know, one knows and he pops up every so often um, in, in these kind of discussions, but I haven't actually read him properly. Yeah, he's, he's um, he seems to be having kind of a, a second wind as well. Um, the, He's, he's been coming up quite a bit in a lot of different circles. But so, you know, McLuhan, for those who are listening and aren't familiar, he, he's a media studies guy or perhaps the media studies guy, right? He really helped found that, that field and that discipline. Um, but, but in, you know, um, a lot of his classic works like the Gutenberg Galaxy, he, and William Irwin Thompson made this connection really very strongly between Gepser and McLuhan, but McLuhan is talking about the evolution of consciousness as well, but he's using um, rather than particularly language or looking at, you know, the relation between time and space, he's looking at communication mediums as we're both familiar with. Um, but the way he describes electronic culture and the electronic human being as the integral human being, funny enough, that word comes up with McLuhan as well, um, he, he describes it as a kind of kaleidoscope of different um, um, vast histories of communication, oral culture, scribal culture, electronic culture, print culture, and all of those different forms of, of um, consciousness really um, are coming forward in the present. And he describes the electronic person, the integral human being, as being kind of co-present with the whole history so that it's all simultaneous, you know. He, he, he has this phrase where he's like, you know, the whole linear chain of cause, of causal sequence is over. Everything is causing everything else. It's a sort of interpenetrating. And that um, he was using James Joyce and uh, Finnegan's Wake as the example and the kaleidoscope of being, of, of the communication medium. So I, I almost imagine it like wearing this kind of shroud, right, of, of all of these different forms of consciousness. And we're all, we're all at play. So as you're just sort of describing that, like, 
in psychotherapy, it's, it's all kind of coming up depending on what's needed. I think this is sort of, this sort of gives us a glimpse of what it could be to be an integral human being or to be in this final participation is to kind of bring forth the wholeness of our being in the present with whatever is necessary in the present and to be do, doing that fully consciously. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I very much like the, the sense of that. There's a, but a, a bell for me rings, and, and tell me whether this is fair, fair or not, a warning bell, because um, it reminds me of Barfield's criticism, actually, of Taya de Chardin, mm. to bring in another name. Um, and Barfield felt that uh, de Chardin, at least, um, had what he called unresolved residual positivism, um, which, broadly speaking, in this sense, is that the, the hope that somehow this new consciousness will come about in the material sphere. Um, and so um, sometimes people talk about technology in that way. People have certainly talked about uh, de Chardin's notion of the new sphere as, um, and the internet as if the internet is somehow a manifestation of the new sphere. Um, and um, the singularity is sometimes discussed, you know, um, uh, that we're kind of entering a sort of singular intelligence, um, you know, through the use of technology and so on. Now, I think that it's not too to dismiss what is achieved through the use of technology. Um, but Barfield certainly felt you mustn't um, ever lose sight of um, how um, this is also, uh, it, it's a sort of psyche sober uh, transcendence that he's seeking. It's not just um, trying, to, trying to make it happen in the material sphere through the tricks of technology. It is a genuine transformation of your consciousness and opening to the inside of the whole world. Mm -hmm. um, and re realizing that that has its own life, its own vitality, its own imperatives, as it were, and learning to relate to that. Um, so I don't know whether that is something that people might say about McEwen or not, actually. I mean, tell me if not. But, but I, I think you know, that, yeah, there is this, the, this positivism, is, it kind of can hover around um, as, a, as a way we can make it happen rather than work on ourselves so that it comes about, you might say. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean, and I, I'm critical of this as well. Uh, I don't. I don't actually know if McLuhan um, believes that or not. I, I think he's been taken for stating that quite a bit because of of the way he writes about. You know, obviously he's talking about the medium being the message, and then if you use the medium, it has an influence on you. Um, but in the little reading I've done of him, it, he seems to be a bit more nuanced and, and much more interested in how the exteriorization of these communication mediums reflects. Um, sense making and and things that are already in the human being there's sort of extensions of our senses we produce these environments there's a kind of a loop where environment and sense making kind of feed each other and push us in a particular direction let's say like um you know the, the alphabet and scribal culture helps us develop abstraction and you mentioned canon and, and that kind of thing um not moving out of of embodied space and into the transcendent or the abstract he would say that was a feedback loop you know there's a kind of an ecology of environmental um factors that both are interior and exterior that's the sense i get from him when when i'm reading him carefully um, but I know that like he gets read like, oh, we're on the internet. So the internet is making us all think this way. And that's, you know, we can just sort of produce good enough technology mediums and it'll do the work for us. Whereas I think it's a much more, um, there's a lot more navigation and exchange and back and forth that happen in reality. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not a deep McLuhan scholar or scribe <laughs> to any degree, um, but Gebser mentions this as well, actually, throughout, and it sounds like Barfield does the same. Um, this idea that the technology is an exteriorization of our own consciousness, that, you know, if we really want to learn something from our technological environments, we have to, we have to see what's employing them, what's coming from within, right? Like, mm -hmm. what is the techno-spatial world, world we produced, and what is the structure of consciousness that is bringing that out into the world, right? Mm. So it's, it's always like a mirror to retract these kind of almost Jungian projections, these like physical objects. It's like, what is this object saying about our own makeup, you know? And why are we producing these environments to begin with, right? Like, I, I find it so interesting that this is not Gebser, but um, like John David Ebert writes about this a bit. He's um, another cultural philosopher where he says, you know, we, we've sort of reproduced the mythical 
cosmologies of the enclosed world, right? Enclosed in a sort of dreaming participation, but we've done it through technology. We've surrounded ourselves with a shell of the technosphere, of satellites, of digital communications, of icons, et cetera. And a lot of these things have kind of mythical um, uh, connotations, but they're done in a very literal exteriorized way. And for, for, I think for Ebert, if I'm reading him correctly, he's saying this is not necessarily like a good thing. It is kind of like we've cut ourselves off from myth so much that the mental is just recreating it, you know, and projecting it into the world, creating literal versions of the thing that it's cut itself off from, which is the soul or the world soul, et cetera. So that's a long, that's a long response mm-hmm. to, your, to your... No, I mean, I, actually, I, I watch um, a lot of John David Ebert's um, YouTube. Okay. I mean, he's very brilliant uh, explaining um, a lot of these big thinkers. Um, but he, he, it's very interesting to me that he's also got quite interested... He's, well, he's had a long interest in astrology, for example. Mm-hmm. And more recently, he's, he's been interested in mediumship and this kind of thing. Um, and um, not straightforwardly, but I, I think... And it's hard to know what to make of these things often. But I think that... My, my sense is that he feels the imperative to not just enclose himself in a shell, um, mm-hmm. to, to, to toy with these things, to experiment, to take risks, you know, to look foolish even, because he realizes that we need to break free of the shell too, and not just live in a sort of lockdown state, um, which if you take, if you confuse the technology with the transformation, that's, that's the risk, exactly. I think. Yeah, exactly. I, I totally agree. I, I think um, along with Gepster that, that technology should always be a mirror to see through to our own, our own consciousness. What, what are we employing and can we retract that somehow? Um, th- there's a very kind of science fiction moment in, in ever present origin where Gepster says, you know, in the integral, like, okay, so just as we've interiorized the cosmos of the mythical, right. Of, of the God in, in the place gets retracted into our selfhood and into our soul, into our subjectivity. What if the technologies that we've sort of unleashed in the world somehow, like the meaning of those get retracted into ourselves at this point? Um, and he just, he just drops this hypothetically, but it's kind of an interesting question. If we get over the literalizations of the modern spatialized technological world, what kind of reality would we want to employ then? You know, and, and what does that even look like if we're not, you know, if we would retract all of these technological projections, what does that future world look like? And I don't know, but I, I find it a very interesting thing to muse on, um, especially right now with the ecological crisis. And, you know, we are kind of having to ask those questions of sort of retracting the over spatialization and the over industrialization of the world. And I kind of wonder what that means culturally as well. But, um, well, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, yeah, this, this is our moment, if you like, but, but I, 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 another really important vanguard for me is William Blake. Um, and I think uh, Blake's notion of the four Zoas has helped me here. So, you know, I think uh, Blake would talk about how the technological world, much like the industrial world of his times, is, is, is being ruled by the Eurozen, by the god, you know, Eurozen, which is your reason gone mad, as it were, trying to control everything, trying to measure everything, parse it down. Uh, turn it into, you know, digitize it, you'd say now. Um, and you, which in a way has got its own genius. Um, you know, Eurizen is almost like a god in, in Blake, but um, you've lost out three other parts of life, you know, which broadly speaking are actually senses, as in be, being connected with nature, um, the, the, the sense world, um, the imaginative world, of course, for Blake, the intuitive world, and then um, uh, the more... Um, uh, Reasonable, reasonable world as in metaphysics rather than uh, that sort of narrowing kind of world. Um, but the, the, the sense of, um, uh, um, well, I mean, the theological, to, to for want of a better word. But anyway, the, the broad point is don't let the technological close you down by losing consciousness of these other capacities, which we have too. Um, and Blake called the four Zoas. Oh, yeah, we, we could go on about, about Blake. <laughs> Um, we're going to have to do a follow-up podcast, but, but last question would be, um, so aside from a, a secret history of Christianity, where should folks go to read more about Barfield? Do you have any recommended starting books, um, in terms of reading Barfield himself and any other secondary literature? Yeah. So, um, in terms of reading Barfield himself, um, a, a good book actually, I think to read is in fact, his first which is um, History in English Words. And um, it's quite a fun book to read, but basically what he does is he tries to tell the story of these shifting consciousnesses through the words that appear at various points in time. 
um, and how they change meaning. So it's like it is literally a history, but told through English words. Um, and, and when they, so I mean, just a little example. And um, he talks a lot about how using the word self um, as a prefix goes bang at the Reformation. Suddenly everyone's self conscious, self aware, self expressive, you know, all these kind of things which we use very, very much now. And it's because there's an intensification of the individual with the Reformation. You know, suddenly you stand before God without the intermediary of the priests. And that intensifies the individual. So it's it's a it's 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 kind of a got a bit of a, a, a nerdy kind of feel if you like words. So it's kind of fun in that way. But he's telling, beginning to tell his story. Um, his kind of magnum opus is saving the appearances. Um, and I, I always feel that you can read that actually almost pick a chapter that kind of grabs you. Um, you don't have to read it completely from start to finish. It starts rather technically actually and. Um, with notions about uh, figuration and alpha this and beta that, and it can be quite abstract and confusing. But you can look through the chapter headings and just go for a chapter that grabs you for some reason or other and get something from it and then return and read it in a kind of circular fashion. Um, another really good place to go is um, the Barfield Literary Estate website, which is trying to put everything Barfield ever wrote online. Um, and does, he wrote a lot of newspaper articles, book reviews, various kind of magazine articles which again can be quite a good way into him um i don't know one little starter look up his review of julian james's um uh the breakdown of the bicameral minds you know which barfield reviewed um you know not unrelated to some of what we've been saying and um he, he critiques it essentially um and but in a very interesting and illuminating way so there's the, there's there's it's owen barfield's grandson who's also called owen barfield who's trying to get a lot of stuff online um, feeling that Barfield's time is coming rather than yeah. his past. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's a growing amount of stuff around. Great. And where, where will people find you online? Thank you. Yeah. So I've got a website, markvernon.com and I too am trying to build articles, conversations like, you know, with, we've, we've been having, um, uh, to, to help people toy with, um, with Barfield and, uh, whether they're coming from a maybe more conventional religious spiritual sense the christian side particularly or more from this integral consciousness side more philosophical psychological psychotherapy side you know there's, there's various ways you can try and get into it so i'm trying to build some conversations and articles that do it in different ways well fantastic mark thank you for an excellent conversation we're gonna have to do this again sometime there's so much more to talk about <laughs> and yeah well uh, thank you too thanks i mean i should say thank you too for the work we should do on gebser because i do feel gebser is a crucial interlocutor with Barfield um, because they're, I think they do see things in quite a similar way and have got something to say to the wider integral community. So thanks for, um, to your own book that tries to open up Gebsa because um, he can be quite daunting as well. Um, well thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's good it's good to be in this moment right now to actually have some some colleagues here and corroborations between the two because you know as as these lone thinkers that are floating out there that are very interesting that's great for us to find them but now for us to kind of come together and begin to speak about it and create this larger dialogue around the texts um, I think that's just so so crucial so um, really really glad to be able to do this with you yeah well thank you fantastic.